are you? Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started this evening, have a couple of songs, and then we'll be, uh, I believe Michael's got an announcement or two, and then we'll be dismissed to our classes in prayer. If you are unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you can pass to the parlor at this time to partake in that. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Our hearts in praise. 
without a doubt will know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place in the moment he appears and the light from heaven shines I'll forget every fear every pain I'll leave behind then I'll see him as he Let's go ahead and pray at this time. Father, as we uh, reflect upon the song that we just sang, we, uh, we, we take our minds to the blessings that we have in this life, our friends and our family, our, our, uh, our dear loved ones, and uh, just for the things that we have, the things that we have in this life. But Father, we know that we are, we are uh, sojourners, we're pilgrims, and uh, let us never uh, take Take that and uh, not think about it. We need to think about it each and every day. Uh, Father, we look forward to being with you um, one of these days. And um, Father, in the meantime, help us to reflect you in all we do. Help us to have our, our, our hearts opened up enough where the Spirit can come in and uh, transform us as we should be looking like your Son. Father, we are grateful for all of our teachers and all the time and all the effort they put into uh, loving us and to loving these kids. And uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we are dismissed to class, um, yeah, I threw a curveball there, didn't I? Um, so we have about 30 signed up for the Sweetheart Banquet. I need you to bring a picture, okay, couples. I need a picture of you and your, 
junior high or your high school days. It can be a little small school picture. It can be a five by seven. But if you'd bring that Saturday night, uh, wear your nice 50s attire. That's optional, but I'm hearing people are putting things together, so that's going to be exciting. And uh, we're looking forward to that time together. Y'all are dismissed to your classes. Can you hear me now? All right, fantastic. Thank you, Albert. I love the fact we're having ministry fair, and I would encourage you to get involved. Find a place where you can serve. You're never as happy as you are when you're doing something good for God. So I think it's a great blessing, and RNC is a marvelous family of God and does lots and lots of good things. I also heard a, a report about the church in Greenbrier that I think is another good news we ought to pass on, their missions program. They, uh, for a small church, they, was it $31,000 that they, uh, they came together and, and just praise God. That's a neat thing. And, of course, we do a lot of missions work here too, don't we? So that's a good thing. Well, why are you here tonight? The seven eternal truths of the book of Revelation. Next week we're going to talk about the fourth eternal truth, the week after that, five and six and seven, and then the last lesson in this series is entitled, What is Heaven Like? And I think you'll really enjoy that one. So let's begin with our eternal truth. What is an eternal truth? Well, Psalms 111, I think, defines it well for us it says, full of splendor, and majesty is his work, referring to God. Whatever God is doing, I'm not talking about just some abstract principle. I'm talking about God's involvement and action in the world. One thing that all ancient cultures shared, whether it was pagan, Jewish, and Christian, was they all believed that God was involved in the world, that he was active, that he was not just sitting there, he was not a watchmaker, that he is very, very involved. And what has happened over the last three centuries is we have made God into almost a watchmaker. He's almost become a, uh, we've almost become deist in many cases, not realizing that God never separated himself from his world. So his righteousness, what God does right, endures forever. That's what makes it eternal. God always acts in a particular way. And he has caused his wondrous works, his righteous activities, to be remembered because God, Yahweh, is gracious and merciful. Eternal truths are the majestic, righteous, gracious, and merciful activities of God. He's doing that right now. 
He will do that in the future. He will do that when there's no more earth. He will do that forever. He is always active. He's always righteous. He's always majestic. And he's always acting. And God has inspired the Bible to reveal and explain them to us so that they may be remembered in our lives. Whenever you're lonely, whenever you're hurting, whenever you need something that you can't grasp and you don't understand what it is, you have a Father that's going to act on your behalf who will love you and care for you and be with you. Those are eternal truths. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever. And the one word I forgot to underline, which I should have, is look at that last line, to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. Eternal truths are always reliable. God never never not does what he says he's going to do. He's always fair. He's always just. And you can trust them with your very life. Whoops. And they will not be altered because God performs them faithfully for how long? Forever. That's an eternal truth. So why do we have the book of Revelation? Why is it there for us? I one time described Revelation... And the rest of the Bible has the 65 footnotes. And in a very real sense, that's true. Revelation ties everything from Genesis all the way up through Jude all together. It brings the whole Bible together. It explains to you how God and Christ are going to act and behave until the end of time. And it will continue. God will continue to be faithful. He will continue to be righteous. He will continue to show and demonstrate His goodness for eternity. So that's why we have the eternal truths. The first reason that you'll discover in chapter 19 is that heaven is singing hallelujah. Now hallelujah is a Hebrew word and when it's in the Old Testament, when you read it in Psalms, it's used about 24 times. You will never find it you, you can search the Old Testament from one end to the other, and you'll never find the word hallelujah. Because the way it's translated is, praise the Lord. That's how it's translated. Or praise Yahweh. Give Him glory. Praise Him. That's what the word hallelujah is. So what John did, after looking at all of this and coming to chapter 19... He took a Hebrew word and made it into a Greek word. It's called transliteration. We did that with the word baptism. Baptizo is the Greek word for baptize. And rather than translating it immerse, our King James brothers, friends, way back four centuries ago, just made it into a Greek word and avoided a lot of problems for us. So that's what John has done with the word hallelujah. So why is heaven saying praise God? Because God's salvation, glory, and power are true, real, and just. After this, I heard, seemed to be a loud voice, of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Heaven is excited because God has judged the prostitute. God has demonstrated that he saves those who love them. God has expressed his glory and his exaltation, that he truly is ruler, and he has shown his power in the judgment of the great prostitute. So let's try to identify her. John says, I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So this prostitute is the one who's murdering Christians. He also says, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints. 
And of all who had been slain, where? On earth. Now that's an interesting expression, isn't it? Think about that for a moment with me. What does, what does John mean by that? Well, he was taught by Jesus what that means. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, and the leaders of Jerusalem said, You serpents, you brood of vipers. Listen, I've never called an audience snakes. I, I, I would be scared to do that. But that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? You serpents, you brood of vipers. And then he asked him, How are you to escape from being sentenced to hell? Wow. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes some of whom you will kill and crucify. Some you will flog in your... What? What is that word? Flog in your what? You're going to beat them in the synagogues and persecute from town to town so that on you, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of those people of God who oppose Christ to his face, said upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the last Old Testament prophet, the son of Rakai, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The great prostitute is Jerusalem and is persecuting the church. They were killing God's people. They did everything in their power to keep the gospel from becoming re Read the book of Acts. You want to know what the historical background and backbone of the book of Revelation is? It's Acts chapter 1 through Acts 28. And only twice do you have Gentiles persecuting Christians. The rest of that time, it is Israel and Judaizing teachers and those coming to kill and flog and hurt. Think about what Paul said. I've been beaten five times with rods, save one. Who's beating him? It's those Jews in the synagogues, just like Jesus said they would. Then the final question continues. And the angel said to me, this is Revelation 17. The waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Then horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Now, I know the beast is Rome, and the ten kings, or the ten horns, are the allied nations of Rome. They're going to hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate. They're going to isolate her. They're going to strip her naked. Do you know what paid for the Colosseum in Rome? Do you know what paid for that house of death? All the loot taken from the temple. And devour her flesh. She literally, there was over 700 to 800,000 people that literally starved to death in the siege of Jerusalem, according to Josephus. And burn her That's exactly what happened. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you'll know that its desolation has come near. And let those who in Judea flee to the mountains, and those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are in the country enter in, for these are the days of vengeance to do what? To fulfill everything that Jesus talked about earlier, to fulfill all that is written. See Isaiah 1 in verse 21, where Jerusalem is called Egypt and Sodom. See Jeremiah 2, 20, where she's called a, a prostitute. Read Ezekiel chapter 16. And you will find that Jerusalem and Israel were called a terrible prostitute. See Hosea. The whole book of Hosea is about 
him marrying a prostitute named Gomer. Israel's great national sin. From its birth, remember with Moses, he's up on the mountain, and what are they doing at the bottom of the mountain? They rose up to play. They were being the prostitute even then. From its birth to its death was idolatry expressed in the murder of God's servant. Jesus, what prophet have you not murdered and not killed? The second reason why heaven is singing hallelujah is that God's judgments are eternal. Once more they cried hallelujah. The smoke of her goes up forever and ever. God is forever condemned. And we'll see that as we study a little bit more. Not only has he condemned the great prostitute, but he's condemned the beast. He's condemned the false prophet. He's condemned all of those things, and we'll see what they are as we go through our study. But I want you to understand that God's judgment is eternal. There is no power on earth like God's. And so when we stand for what's right, we have the full force of God behind us. The third reason why heaven is singing hallelujah is God commands mortals to worship because of his righteous activity. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. God invites us mortals to join in the praise because of God's righteous activity. The fourth reason why heaven is singing hallelujah are that the seven eternal truths or blessings of God's reign are in place forever. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah for the Lord our God Almighty. What's that word, church? He reigns. He rules. He's in charge. That's what Revelation is trying to get us to see. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to take a back seat. And God is in charge of everything. And he always has been. But now he's revealed Jesus. He's revealed his word. And he's caused it to be remembered. And we can see the power and the work of God in our everyday lives. Let me just ask you. Which makes more sense? Would God write a book that would only affect the very last generation of earth? Or would he write a book to close out his book that would be effective for every generation that lived thereafter? Which of those two do you think would be more reasonable from God's perspective? Doesn't God want this generation to know what the earlier generations knew? And doesn't he want the generations that follow us to know what he does? That's why Revelation is not about the end of time. But it's about the time until the end. Hallelujah, our God reigns. The first eternal truth, our blessing of God's reign, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice, let us rejoice and exalt and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Let's explain a little bit about Jewish marriage customs real quickly. A marriage took place over about seven days. And it first began with the two families signing a contract. A dowry is agreed, an amount of money is, uh, uh, is set aside for the bride, and from that point on, she's in a legal relationship with her, her spouse-to-be. That's why Matthew decided to divorce Mary before he had formally married her. He was going to end that signed contract. So Jesus had a signed contract. He had a bride. In fact, John says, I must decrease, but the bridegroom must what? Increase. You remember that? Jesus said, 
The reason my disciples aren't, aren't fasting is because you don't do that when the bridegroom is there. So the bridegroom has come, and the bride has made herself ready. She's prepared herself for her wedding day. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 that I espoused you, I betrothed you to Christ as a pure bride. So when does the marriage come? Well, Jesus in the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 20 states that the marriage of the king's son takes place after the king burns the city of those who refuse to come to the feast. Notice that in Matthew 20. He burned the city and then they had the marriage feast. The right attire for that marriage feast is crucial. But when the king came in and looked at the guests, he saw a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That man hadn't put on a blood-soaked robe of Jesus. He hadn't come into salvation. He hadn't been saved. How many of you, when you were baptized into Christ, what did you put on? You put on your wedding attire, didn't you? You are not only the bride, but you're also the guest at the marriage supper. In other words, the marriage supper means that God plans and does have an intimate relationship with his people. What will tire is required? Well, I will greatly rejoice, Isaiah 61. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with, we're saved by grace through faith, salvation, the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, the righteousness that Paul talks about that comes by faith, not of my own, but that which is done because I believe God and I trust God and I will walk in faith in that trust. The bridegroom decks himself out like a priest with a beautiful headdress. I'm worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's what priests do, don't they? We offer to God spiritual sacrifice. We're clothing ourselves in the garments of spiritual priests. And finally, the apostles' fellowship Read uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 3, I'm sorry. No one has laid any foundation other than which is laid in Christ. If any man builds on it with gold and silver and jewels, or hay, wood, or straw, it will be manifest in the day what kind of work he's done. Some of it will be burned up, but some of it's going to remain because it was built in Christ as a precious jewel. When you get to chapter 21, you'll notice the foundations of that city that comes down out of heaven to the earth are the apostles. And embedded in the apostles are all these precious jewels. Do you know what you are in God's eyes? You are a precious gem. You are, many of you are diamonds in the rough, I understand. But he's going to polish you up and make you look good. Because we are all gems in God's eyes. The first eternal truth are blessing God's reign. It's the marriage of the supper. He says, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Have all of you been invited to the marriage supper? Do you realize how blessed you really are? And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now let's just stop and think about angels for a moment, okay? I'm talking about the supernatural beings that God has created, that are his messengers, that are his servants. Angels and humans are now fellow what? Fellow servants. Why is that? How, what do we share with angels now? Angels gave the prophets the testimony of Jesus. Listen to this. 
The law was put in place by our fellow workers, the angels. Paul says, why then the law? It was added because of transgression. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made, and it was put in place through what, church? Through angels. Think about that. God goes, comes down on Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up the mountain. And what does Moses encounter? He encounters God. But he also encounters tens of thousands of angels. In fact, it says the chairs of God are twice 10,000. And in this context of Psalm 68, he's talking about the giving of the law. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in his sanctuary. Go to Acts chapter 7 sometime and read the last words that Stephen says to the Sanhedrin before they stone him. He says, angels brought you the law and yet you're stiff-necked and hard-hearted and you always turn on God. And that's what Paul is saying. So the angels were the ones who gave us the Old Testament and the Spirit. They are our fellow workers. They gave us the testimony of Jesus. Because everything from Genesis 1 to Malachi 4 is Jesus Christ. You don't interpret the Old Testament and leave him out of it. When you do, then you miss the whole point of what the angels were trying to do. They are our fellow workers. Now, what are we? Are we not the angels or the messengers of God? What are you supposed to do every time you get an opportunity? Are you not supposed to share the gospel with someone? See, we're fellow workers. We do basically the same thing. We give the gospel, though. We give the good news. The second eternal truth or blessing of God's reign is the living word saves, judges, and makes war. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called, what is it, church? The Word of God. Why a white horse? Well, it will help understand a little bit of recent history. In AD 60, Nero sent two legions of Romans into a country called Parthia. A legion consists of approximately five to 6,000 men, and when you include the auxiliaries, it was an army of right around 20 to 22,000 men. They are the best infantry. They were always considered, you couldn't ever defeat Rome. Rome just didn't lose a war. They had beaten everybody, but when they went into Parthia, Parthians had a secret weapon. They had horse cavalry. And this horse cavalry had a compound bow. And they just simply rode rings around the legion, stayed out of their bow range, because their bow would reach farther, and they just simply picked those Roman legions apart. They defeated them in mass. And it was a bloody, bloody John picks a symbol that people knew that Rome could be defeated by. That was the best thing going at that point as far as a military weapon. I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. The ones, and that goes back to Zechariah 4 too. The one sitting on it is called what? Faithful and true. And in righteousness, what does he do? What is his activities? He judges and makes what? War. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He is zealous. He is a mighty warrior. And on his head are many diadems. Oh, church, can you even come close to fathoming the power of Jesus Christ? That's what a diadem is. It's a crown of power. It's so many we can't, it's infinite. And then he says, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Only he understands his authority. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name 
by which he is called is the word of God. Now, there's a difference between Jesus delivering his kingdom up at the end of time and Jesus exercising the word of God on earth as the living word. And what Revelation is revealing to you is that Jesus is exercising through the word of God. He's saving people and he's judging people all at the same time. That's what this is about. Cannot refer to the end of time. Why? Because Jesus is actually saving souls by wrapping them in his blood-soaked robe. In addition, he is judging and warring against his enemies who refuse his word. The word of God can do one of two things to you depending on your response to it. It can save you. It can transform you. Or it can kill you and cut you off from God. There's no middle ground. You can't be halfway saved. You're either saved or you're not. Either the Word of God is living in your life and you're trying through faith to obey it, or you're in opposition to it. And if you are, then you are spiritually dead. The living Word saves, judges, makes war, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them or shepherd them with a rod of iron. And in the Old Testament, that rod of iron is always the word coming from his mouth. He will tread the winepress of the fury of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thighs, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is the supreme, most important, the ultimate power on earth today? It is not a hydrogen bomb. That's the most powerful. And you know, with that, we could stand and they could shoot us all day long. And we would still be in it. Because God rules and God reigns. Jesus, the living word, exercises God's power and will. He is the living word of creation. In the beginning was the what? The word in the word was what? God. So he's the living word of creation. All of creation holds together because of him. He's the living word in the flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt what? Among us to reveal God's glory. He is the living word as God's principal power to work his will on earth. Read Isaiah 55. My word, it goes forth like water and springs. It brings blessing. And it does not come back to me empty. Jesus is the one through whom God works his will here on this earth. He is a living word that upholds the universe in its present form. And someday it is that very same word, Jesus, who will end this old world and call an end to it. Because he upholds it. And he will change it by the word, just like he did in the flood in Noah's day. By the word, by Christ, he brought that flood in judgment. Of utmost importance to us is that Jesus, as the living word, sees and knows every thought and intention of our individual hearts. For the word of God is living and active, sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from, and I underlined his sight for a reason. That's a pronoun, right? Pronouns have antecedents. And the antecedent, what comes before it, is identifying what it is. The living word of God is a person in this passage. Before him, he says, no creature is hidden from his sight. God's Son is a living sword that pierces to the very soul and the intent of your heart. And you can't hide from it. You stand before him exposed and naked, and everyone must give an account for you. That's why the New Testament, that's why when we stand before God, that we're going to be judged by the 
can't hide from it. You can't run from it. Jesus is the perfect Savior. He is the perfect judge. And he is the perfect warrior for the lost. The third eternal truth of God's name is that Christ, God's wrath upon Christ's foes, is their spiritual death. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, Revelation 19. And generally, sun in the Old Testament is a symbol for the wrath of God. With a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly overhead. Can you imagine a world without vultures? A scientist say we would soon die out because of all the disease and pestilence and decaying animals. Vultures are necessary for our, our life here. Believe it or not, that's really true. And so God has some spiritual vultures. Come gather for the great supper of God. Wow. This is not pleasant. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who is in its presence has done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who is sitting on the horse. Is this a spiritual death or a physical death? What he's describing is spiritual death. Because they're slain not by a real sword, are they? Not by a physical sword. But they're slain by the word of God. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So who are Christ's enemies? Well, first of all, there's the beast. And he's described as a seven-headed tiger, seven-headed beast. Listen to what Revelation 17, 9 says. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seating. Jerusalem set her power on Roman power. The Herodians could not have ruled without Rome's permission. The Sanhedrin could not have met without Rome's permission. All of them were in cahoots with Rome to maintain Power. That's why the woman is sitting on the beast. And so he says, they are seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other is not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. Augustus is the first Roman emperor. Tiberius is the second Roman emperor. Caligula, little boots. You know how he got his name? When he was a little boy, his father was a Roman general, and he was taken to the camp, and they dressed him up as a little soldier. And the men so loved this little guy, he had on little war boots, and so they called him Little Boots. And that's Caligula, that's what it means. But he wasn't a sweet guy, he was insane and crazy. There was Claudius, probably the best of all of these guys. And then there was Nero, five of Then there's Octus. One other has not yet come, and when he does, he must remain only. He ruled for three months. And then he was usurped. And the dynasty, the, the dynasty of Caesar was basically snuffed out by this person. Christ's enemies, the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. This is from Isaiah's prophecy about Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah 2.19, The people shall enter caves of the rock, the holes of the ground, from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty, when he rises to terrify the earth. It is the Herodian dynasty. And the woman you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, let's identify the great city. When they had finished their testimony, talking about Moses and Elijah in chapter 11, the beast that arises from the bottom of the pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. A 
and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt. Notice that last line. Where their Lord was gone. Who is the Lord of Moses and Elijah? Who is the Lord of the law of the prophets? Is that not Jesus? Is he not the one that was crucified in the great city? Notice, what great city crucified the Lord of Moses and Elijah? God's two witnesses to Israel. And the answer is Jerusalem. There's a great and read your New Testament for all it's worth. Read it and read it and, and look at how Satan used Judaism to divide, try to prevent the Word of God from being written, to try to prevent the Gospel from being preached. He tried everything in his power to keep the Gospel from saving people in the first century. Christ's enemies, the third one is the false prophet. For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. And then down in verse 22, speaking of the same men, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I false prophet or the Judaizing. They're teaching a false doctrine. You've got to be saved by the law of Moses, not by grace. Or we're going to add the law to the gospel, the law plus the gospel. Either way, it is a damnable heresy. And people continue to do that to this day. Roman Jerusalem are the persecutors of the first century church. Obviously, we know that. We have great history about Rome's persecution in 64 through 67 A.D. But what we don't often think about is how the early church looked at Judaism. This is an allegory found in Galatians chapter 4. And he says the two wives of Abraham are symbolic. It's an allegory. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. That's Sarah, bearing children. Uh, one is from Mount Sinai. That's Hagar. She bears children for slavery. Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And in the allegory, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Well, what is the present Jerusalem doing to the church? It's trying to keep it from growing. It's trying to kill it. Read the book of Acts. Who are the enemies? Who's following Paul around? Who's creating riots? Who's disturbing? Every time Paul goes somewhere, What's going on? She is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above, that's Sarah. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For now your brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just at the time as he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is what? Well, the book, the Bible itself, identifies the two great persecutors, Judaism and Rome. Christ, through the sword of his mouth, destroys every enemy until the last in death. The beast, he destroys every political system that demands worship of God. That's what the beast demanded, didn't it? And there were two in the 20th century, communism and Nazism. Did God destroy them? He did, did he not? He destroys the kings that are, destroys every theocracy. Religious leaders who are heads of government. Half the world called Islam is led by theocracy. What do you think their chances of success are? Absolutely none. He did it to Herod. He's going to do it to them. He always keeps his word. Every false prophet, he destroys every religious system, including Satan, that is not submissive to the word from his mouth. Well, I have run out of time. The living word judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I'm going to skip real quick. Take 
away. Let me give these to you real quick. The marriage supper. We enjoy a rich spiritual feast of his loving word in the eternal kingdom. The veil, the spiritual blindness that keeps us from seeing God and one another is removed. God is swallowing up death as he stands firm. God is comforting and removing our shame. And we find eternal joy and gladness in this word. Take that away. That's what Revelation is trying to get you to see. The second takeaway is the presence of the living word. We are not orphans because God has adopted us into being sons of God. And sons of God are often expressions of angels in the Old Testament. Jesus manifests or shows himself to us in the Word. Because he lives, we live. We are loved because we keep Jesus' Word. And the Father and Son have come from heaven to make their home in your heart. That's a great takeaway. And then the final one. God is to be feared. He's to be held in deep respect. Nothing can stand up to the anger of God. God utters his judgment from heaven, and when he does, the earth stands still. And God arises to save the humble. It is the meek who will inherit the earth. You submit to the word of God, and you will inherit the life that God intended for you to live here on earth with him. Just like Adam was intended to live with God, and someday he will take you to heaven. Either when you die, you will be in his presence, or if he happens to come, when he blows that last trumpet and he delivers his kingdom back to the Father, you can rise in the air and be with all of his saints. Praise God. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I ran you over. I love you all. Thank you.